The Anglo-American system of jurisprudence is the only one which developed out of what is called the common law, that is, the general law of private property known in the British Isles. Common law was designed through the years to secure the rights of individuals to property, to make it difficult for property to be taken away without due process of law. The common law was expounded over the years in case decisions as a result of trials in which the common law jury acted as the judges and in which they exercised the authority to hear and decide questions of both law and fact. And common law deals with legal relationships powers and liabilities, and types of actions rather than theoretical definitions of abstract legal concepts. It's from such controversies involving property that all of our rights have come. Property is known as substance at the common law and includes hard money in the form of gold and silver coin. Controversies involving these matters carry with them where rights are found. The judge in a court of law is an impartial referee of the dispute, and he is bound to protect the rights of the parties to the dispute, or he will have lost whatever jurisdiction he may have had or claimed to have had. Gold and silver coin are the only things recognized at law to be money. Money is substance in possession and not a thing in action. When a debt's paid at law, the debt is extinguished. Debt no longer exists. The debt is paid. Debt can only be paid with gold and silver coin or certificates redeemable on demand at par in gold and silver coins. This is the legal meaning of the expression tender in payment of debt as found in Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution of the United States. Thomas Jefferson placed great emphasis on the concept of rights. He said, We did not bring the English common law as such to this continent. We brought the rights of man. The common law of the states of the United States is the common law of England adopted by the original Constitution of the United States. So far, as not modified by any alterations made by the Constitution of the state at the time of admission to the Union, and so far as not in direct conflict with the Constitution of the United States of America, and the common law of the states may not be modified limited nor abrogated either by an act of the legislature, Congress, or state legislature, or by a ruling of some judge. Part of the problem that we're in is a result of unlawful attempts by legislatures or judges to modify or abrogate common law. While in England, this law was derived from feudal tenures in real property as held by a pyramid of proprietors holding their rights from the king or crown on down the line, the American Revolution destroyed any and all allegiance to the British crown, including the rights of property in land and all feudal tenures and dues were overthrown. All rights of property in land in the United States became allodial titles 
in allodial freehold, under no lord or overlord whatsoever, even the authority of the colony or state. This is the reason why our founding fathers considered that they had made every man a king on his own property. In England, William Pitt summarized the concept of private property under common law as follows. The poorest man may, in his cottage, bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storms may enter, the rain may enter, but the king of England cannot enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. As a result of all of this, the common law of the states is founded and grounded upon substantive titles in real property, and no mere legislative enactment by Congress or state legislature, nor judicial ruling by federal or state courts, can operate to deprive the people of their rights at law, including their rights inherent in their allodial land titles, and to be merchants and or traders at law on the cash basis, and their rights to access to courts of law and to a jurisdiction where their rights are protected. As contrasted with the common law of England, the system of law as practiced on the continent of Europe is called civil law or Roman civil law, which is derived from the law of the ecclesiastical chancellors. This is partly the ancient law of Rhodes, the law of merchant traders upon commercial documents. The civil law is prosecuted by the chancellor. He is not an impartial referee of the dispute. This civil law of Roman origin has never been part of the laws of England and has been declared not of the laws of the realm by the Parliament and by many experts of England in jurisprudence, such as Coke, Blackstone, and Sir John Fortescue. The common law is absolutely distinguished from the Roman or civil law system. The Roman civil law has always been outside of common law, operating on summary process in gross violation of our rights to due process. As English society developed over the years, situations were met in the common law for which the courts could provide no relief by any precedent. The controversies did not involve property or substance. The parties thus had no other recourse than to go to the king. And when they did, he delegated his first minister to solve these problems. The minister was called a chancellor, the same title as used on the continent. And the relief granted was called equity. This equity meant what would be fair if the common law principles were extended and applied to the case at hand, as the Chancellor, in his discretionary judgment, chose to do. There thus developed in England and America two distinct systems of law and courts, each having a peculiar and particular application and jurisdiction. Equity 
is a jurisdiction in which the individual does not have any rights and one to which the individual can be subjected only if he volunteers or gives his informed consent. In equity, there are no jury trials. The powers of the common law jury to hear and decide questions of both law and fact are exercised by the chancellor. However, there may be advisory juries to advise the chancellor of certain facts, but they're not permitted to hear any arguments regarding the law. Does this sound familiar today? The controversies are decided by the chancellor, who, besides being the chief prosecutor, or inquisitor if you will, can go to any source he chooses, even to his own conscience, to prove or justify his decision. In equity, parties do not have any rights. The Constitution is stated by the Chancellor to be frivolous, and any so-called rights in his court are actually privileges granted by the Chancellor, which he can also take away. During the past century, the Congress of the United States and the legislatures of the several states, as well as the judges, have presumed to exercise authority to merge the procedures of law and equity. This is authority they don't have, yet this too is part of the problem we face. In part two of this chapter, we'll break down the merger of law and equity as happened in this country, the United States and the individual states, and we'll also begin to discuss something called law merchant.